Hello and welcome to lecture number four. Today we'll investigate the early histories of the middle colonies and those of the lower south from about the late 17th to mid 18th centuries. Several themes will be addressed in this lecture. First, it will explore the development of the middle colonies, particularly New York and Pennsylvania. It will then discuss the early history of the colonies of the Lower South, with a focus on South Carolina and the development of slavery. By the end of this presentation, you should be able to compare and contrast the early history of these colonies, as well as to describe life for slaves living in South Carolina. New York and Pennsylvania were each part of the Middle Colonies. We will begin with a study of New York's early settlement by Europeans. This map identifies the major towns, cities, and forts included in the Middle Colonies. Eventually, the prosperity of the region was based on the thriving commerce of its largest cities, Philadelphia and New York, and on the commercial production of wheat. The important early European colonizers in New York did not come from either England, Spain, or France, but instead from the Netherlands. Dutch claims to this region stemmed from the explorations of Henry Hudson, who in 1609 sailed up the river which now bears his name, as shown on the map. In 1614, Dutch traders established Fort Nassau, near the present-day city of Albany. Later in the 1620s, the colony of New Netherland was founded on Manhattan Island. It was the Dutch West India Fur Company which established New Netherland in 1625. The company was formed with the goal of earning money for its investors in the region's prosperous fur trade. They also attempted to encourage migration to the colony by offering large land grants, called patroonships, to individuals who agreed to settle at least 50 people on the land. In the end, a small group of elites began to dominate the land holdings as they were able to amass large estates under the system. By the late 1660s, there were perhaps 9,000 residents living in New Netherland, sandwiched between English colonies to the north and south. Tension grew between the imperial powers, and England dispatched a force of ships to conquer the Dutch settlement. The governor of New Netherland at the time, Peter Stuyvesant, attempted to rally the Dutch against the English, but it was to no avail. In 1664, he surrendered without a shot being fired. From then on, New Netherland became known as New York. occupation by the Netherlands left a lasting legacy for New York. In many ways the colony's population was characterized by diversity. Only about half of the colonists in the 1660s were Dutch. Others were English, German, French, Scandinavian, and African, free as well as enslaved. There were also Protestants, Catholics, Jews, and Muslims. However, it's also true there were no organized places of worship for many years. The Dutch presence is also seen with, among other things, place names such as Harlem, Brooklyn, and social customs such as painting Easter eggs and cooking waffles. We will now study the early history of the colony of Pennsylvania. While the Dutch West India Fur Company dominated the early history of what is now New York, it was one individual who founded Pennsylvania and had a great deal of influence on the colony's early history. That person's name was William Penn. William Penn was the son of Sir Admiral William Penn, an English naval hero who was close to England's King Charles II. To reward the Penn family for their loyalty, and to repay them for money loaned to the king, Charles II granted William Penn a charter to establish a colony in 1681. This turned out to be an immense tract of fertile land west of the Delaware River. Penn had two primary goals as he founded his new colony. First, he wanted to establish a holy experiment where members of the Quaker religious sect could live and practice their religion freely. The Quaker faith, more properly known as Society of Friends, was founded by George Fox in the mid-1600s. 
By the latter half of the century, they were still viewed as a fringe group by many in England and faced persecution. They placed emphasis on what they believed was an inner light inside everyone's soul. Because all had this inner light, they took a more egalitarian approach to interaction with others and to worship. The sketch shown here demonstrates what some consider to be a radical Quaker practice, a woman speaking in church. Quakers allowed women a voice in church policy and on some decision-making issues. A second goal for Penn was the hope that he could make some money for his troubles. Overall, immigration to Pennsylvania was consistent and successful. By the late 1680s, over 8,000 had traveled from Europe to the colony. While many traveled from England as migrants, as shown with this map on the right, others came from Ireland, Scotland, Wales, Germany, and Scandinavian countries to live in Penn's colony which offered religious toleration. Economically, Pennsylvania's colonists experienced a great deal of success. By the early 1700s, as shown with the engraving at the top of this image, Philadelphia became one of the most important ports along the Atlantic coast, where bumper crops were exported to outside markets. For more information on Penn's life, as well as the early history of Pennsylvania, you may click on one of the two hyperlinks below. Now we'll move southward and explore the unique history associated with the colony of South Carolina. In the 1660s, England's King Charles II granted a group of supporters the right to colonize land south of Virginia and north of Spain's settlements in Florida. The region was named Carolina. Probably its leading city was Charlestown, later Charleston, with a valuable natural harbor. In 1729, the overall region was officially divided into North and South Carolina. South Carolina was settled by Europeans about 50 years after the Pilgrims landed at Plymouth Colony, beginning in 1670. What's interesting about this colony is, in many ways, it was a colony of a colony. Instead of traveling straight from Europe, a large number of the region's first settlers came from the Caribbean colonies, particularly Barbados. Do you remember this slide from an earlier lecture over the New England colonies? The first half of the 17th century saw a large increase in English migration to the New World. While many did travel to the New England colonies, as this map indicates, an even larger segment of immigrants traveled to the West Indies. The circled area on this map provides a more detailed focus of the region. Many Europeans settled there, including Dutch, Spanish, French, as well as English colonists. Almost 60% of the English colonists emigrating to the Americas between 1630 and 1642 ended up settling in the Caribbean. Overall, the influx of settlers was quite large. The economy of these Caribbean colonies was most heavily based on sugarcane production, which was very labor-intensive as shown with the image on the left. Indentured servants were originally employed, but plantation owners increasingly began to rely on the labor of enslaved Africans, who then became the dominant labor force. In English West Indies, black slaves outnumbered whites by a ratio of about 4 to 1 by 1700. So, beginning in the 1670s, many traveled to the Carolinas from the Caribbean. They settled there for economic reasons as some of the best land had already been taken. As they began to establish roots, they experimented with a few different industries before they settled on one key crop. The important cash crop produced in South Carolina was rice. Now that a bit of background information has been provided as to the early history of South Carolina, we can go into more detail about how the presence of rice as a cash crop influenced the colony's history particularly in terms of its labor force.
colonists searched for different sources of labor to work in their rice fields. Native Americans were tried initially, and there was an extensive Indian slave trade where Native Americans were used as laborers. However, many escaped, and traders also noticed a large profit could be made by transporting Indian slaves to regions outside of the Carolinas. Next, indentured servants were used. White servants made up a large segment of the labor force, but once exposed to the harsh climate and diseases, such as yellow fever and malaria, which were common, many became sick or died. Eventually, they settled on African slaves. South Carolinians switched to using African slaves for a variety of reasons. First, even though slaves cost more money, once purchased, they were once property for life. Secondly, Africans had a unique background and skill set. For centuries in West Africa, they had planted, harvested, and cooked rice, so their knowledge was extensive. In many cases, they had more knowledge of rice cultivation than their owners. Finally, health factors played a role. Malaria and yellow fever were common in South Carolina, and many Europeans became incapacitated or died when exposed to these diseases. Many Africans had natural immunities to these same diseases. As a result of their reliance on the labor of African slaves, by the 17-teens, blacks outnumbered whites in South Carolina. This had unique results for the history of the colony. For more information, a great resource on this subject and an important source for this lecture is a book written by Peter Wood and first published in 1974. The book's title, Black Majority. We will now explore some of the characteristics of the African slave trade and life under slavery for people living in South Carolina. Up to about 10 million Africans were involved in the slave trade. Approximately 400,000 of those eventually came to live in British North America. It's believed this was the largest forced migration in human history. Probably the worst aspect of this journey was the so-called Middle Passage, the voyage from Africa to the New World. This map identifies the origins of African slaves. Almost all slaves brought to English North America came from West Africa, part of which included the so-called Rice Coast because of the prevalence of rice cultivation in the region. Slavery was common in Africa long before Portuguese traders became involved with the slave trade. For centuries, African slaves were primarily debtors, criminals, or captives of wars, and slavery was often a temporary condition. Once Europeans became involved, slaves were permanently removed from Africa and almost always faced a lifetime of slavery. Both Africans and Europeans played a critical role in the African slave trade. In this illustration, African slave drivers marched their captives wearing chains and neck clamps from their village. Their likely destination? European ships waiting along the west coast of Africa. Here we see the interior design of a slave ship. It graphically depicts the crowded, unsanitary conditions under which enslaved Africans were packed like cargo and transported across the Atlantic. Different shipping companies competed with one another to develop designs whereby additional slaves could be placed within their hold, thereby increasing profitability. The death rate on these voyages could be staggering, and it's estimated that on average between 10 to 20 percent died before their journey was over. Once they arrived in North America, they faced a lifetime of servitude. Conditions awaiting them in South Carolina could be somewhat different as compared to those facing Africans in other colonies. This was due to the huge rice plantations in which they worked, with large numbers of slaves and the fact that blacks outnumbered whites. In the Lower South, and particularly South Carolina, the task system was common. The heat and working conditions were so intense that slaves were given a series of jobs or chores to complete during the course of the day. When finished, one's efforts were done. This allowed slaves some control over the pace of their work, and others even found time to supplement their diet by raising animals or planting small gardens. It often kept slaves isolated from other whites on the plantation, and on a day-to-day -day basis, slaves under this system often did not work closely with other whites. <laughs> 
This can be compared to conditions faced by slaves farther north living on tobacco plantations in the Chesapeake Bay. Here, slaves tended to work in small gangs, which were sometimes grouped by gender or age. Often, gangs would work alongside ever-watchful whites as they would toil from sun up to sun down. Whether working as a gang laborer or under the task system, slavery's brutality was seen by all slaves. Because they were the property of their owners, they were bought and sold like livestock. They worked long hours and faced brutal beatings, often for no reason. They usually lived in one-room shacks with dirt floors, while their diet generally consisted of corn and salted pork day after day. Because blacks constituted a majority of the population, and often worked in relative isolation from whites, they were able to hold on to their African heritage in unique ways. Often, parents gave their children African names, sometimes naming them after days of the week. Music and musical instruments also reflected an African heritage at times. Finally, a unique language came to be spoken in the region called Gullah. This was a pidgin language made up of words from English and many different African dialects, which was still spoken at times in the 20th century. Slaves acted and reacted to the conditions they faced in a wide range of ways. On one end of the spectrum of reactions would be slaves who were completely submissive and obedient. These were probably very small in number. On the other edge of the spectrum would be slaves who were completely resistant. Fear of a major insurrection was felt by many plantation owners. Slaves also might physically attack their owners or attempt to kill them in some way. While those two extremes and behaviors did take place, the most common form of resistance was often quite subtle. Most slaves, at one time or another, engaged in some sort of subtle resistance, even on a daily basis. There are many different examples of what could be cited as subtle resistance. They might include breaking tools or faking illnesses. A slave considered to be sick might be provided with alcohol as medicine. Some might pretend not to know how to use some tools, while others might pretend not to understand English. Another form of subtle resistance might be escape for short periods of time, like a few weeks or even a month. While they would face punishment upon their return, escape to freedom was nearly impossible for someone with black skin and a limited knowledge of geography. As mentioned earlier, the biggest fear of slaveholders was of a major rebellion involving a large number of slaves. Well, their biggest fears came true in 1739 with what came to be known as the Stono Rebellion, which took place just outside of Charlestown on the Stono River. The context of the rebellion was important. It took place in the middle of a yellow fever outbreak in Charlestown, and as news of hostilities between England and Spain became public. The rebellion began on an early Sunday morning in September of 1739. About 20 slaves were initially involved in the rebellion, and they were led by a slave named Jemmy, who had been born in Africa. They broke into a store and took weapons and powder. Meanwhile, they killed the storekeepers and placed their heads on display. They were joined by slaves from other plantations and killed several slave owners on their way, while sparing others who were known to treat their slaves kindly. They headed southward, probably to Spanish Florida, until they were intercepted in the late afternoon by local militia. The rebel slaves fought against the militia, and the rebellion was put down, but the uprisings continued for several weeks. In the end, many slaves were killed, while those who were captured were executed. The heads of the slaves were cut off and put on mileposts as reminders of what would happen to slaves involved in an insurrection. Twenty whites and about a hundred slaves were killed in what was the largest slave rebellion of the colonial era. For more information concerning the Stono Rebellion, you may click on the hyperlink below. Reaction to the Stono Rebellion was swift and significant. In order to prevent another slave rebellion, a new slave code was put into place where slave patrols were expanded so that slaves faced almost constant surveillance. It also fined slave owners who failed to keep their slaves in line. Overall, the legacy of the Stono Rebellion placed tighter restrictions on the behavior of slaves, but also on white slave owners in order to prevent another such insurrection in the future.
Now we will explore the last of the original 13 colonies in English North America as we study the early history of the colony of Georgia. The new colony of Georgia was founded in 1732. It was named in honor of King George II, who chartered it in hopes that it would become a buffer between South Carolina and the Spanish in Florida. The colony was to be ruled by a group of trustees for its first two decades. One trustee, James Oglethorpe, was the dominant figure in the early history of Georgia. He was a philanthropist who hoped the colony could serve as a haven for debtors who could leave jail if they agreed to relocate in Georgia. He became interested in prison reform following the death of a friend who had been confined to a debtor's prison. He and other trustees hoped the colony could survive without slavery and alcohol, outlawing both. They also hoped to encourage the development of independent small farms by limiting land holdings to no more than 500 acres. By 1740, nearly 3,000 colonists had arrived. In its early years, immigrants came from Germany, Switzerland, Scotland, and England. Many missionaries also set to work in hopes of spreading Christianity. One such missionary was John Wesley, who later founded the Methodist Church after returning to England. While they began their task with high hopes, the colony's population remained quite small. Very few debtors were allowed to leave prison and move to Georgia, and the size limits of land holdings proved to be impractical. By 1750, slavery had been legalized and size limits for the land holdings were lifted. Life in Georgia began to mimic that of South Carolina with the rise of a small group of elite planters who relied on slave labor. While Oglethorpe's vision of a debtor's haven was not realized, he was still important as the most dedicated leader in the early history of Georgia. We will now review some of the important concepts addressed in this lecture. This lecture has traced the early history of the middle colonies, including New York and Pennsylvania, as well as colonies of the Lower South, particularly the Carolinas and Georgia. You should now be able to compare and contrast key events and people which shaped these regions. It's also described life for Africans living in the Deep South. You should be able to describe the history of the African slave trade and the ways in which different slaves acted and reacted to their enslavement. This concludes lecture number four. I hope you found this information to be interesting, and the next few slides will offer some hyperlinks to additional sources of information as well as lists of sources used for this presentation. Have a great day.